This video was brought to you by Skillshare. On Sunday, Spaniards up and down the country went to the polls to vote in a snap general election. Now, this election was meant to put Spain's political drama to bed. In reality, though, it's done anything but. Neither the right nor the left have a clear and stable path to a governing majority, yet both are currently claiming victory. So, in this video, we're going to take you through the Spanish election. Who, if anyone, won? and what all of this means for Spain and Europe more generally. Before we start, TLDR EU is currently only just behind TLDR UK's subscriber count. So if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to this channel and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and help TLDR EU win the subscriber race. First things first, some background. And it's worth noting that this election didn't have to happen. Rather, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez surprised more or less everyone by calling this election on the back of the recent local elections. Now, what makes it even more surprising is that his party, the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, or PSOE, did quite badly in that election, while support for the right-wing People's Party and far-right Vox soared. When announcing the snap election, Sanchez stressed that voters had, quote, transmitted a message by voting for PP and Vox, and that the country needed, quote, a clarification when it comes to the policies that the national government should offer, and a clarification when it comes to the political groups that should lead this phase. Now, calling this snap election was always going to be a gamble for Sanchez, especially on the back of local election losses. And while he might have nominally appealed to a sense of national duty to figure out what the Spanish people wanted, everyone could see that this decision to call a snap election was mainly about party politics. That's because Sanchez was clearly hoping that the election and the prospect of being completely wiped out would force the fractured left wing to stop squabbling and get behind a common agenda and a common platform. In this respect, Sanchez was successful. After the snap election was announced, a number of left-wing parties came together under the SUMA, or UNITE, platform, bringing together the left more than it had been for years. But that's enough background. Who actually won this election? Well, at the time of writing, there's not actually a clear answer. The favourites throughout the election campaign, PP and Vox, have a combined total of 169 seats, seven short of an absolute majority. Even if we add in smaller right-aligned parties such as CC and UPN, we're still short of a majority. On the left, the major left-wing parties, PSOE and SUMA, have 153 seats, which obviously isn't enough for majority either. Then when we add in the smaller parties that previously supported Sanchez, we jump up to 172, but that's still four short of an absolute majority. That means that for either bloc to reach the crucial 176 required for a majority, they would also need the support of the hardline pro-Catalan independence party Together for Catalonia, also known as the Junts, who now sit as potential kingmakers. But more on them in a moment. In other words, if Sanchez or Feijo want to become prime minister, they'll need to hold tough talks with smaller parties to even get close. And these smaller parties are going to be eyeing some big concessions in return for their support. And the parliamentary arithmetic here is made all the more complex due to the Spanish constitution. In what's referred to as positive parliamentarianism, any prospective government must, in the first instance, be actively supported by Parliament in an investiture vote. In practical terms, this means that the government must get the approval of an absolute majority of members of the Congress of Deputies. Crucially, they can't merely be tolerated, as abstention is, in effect, a vote against. While this might seem like a relatively moot point, it is quite significant because requiring active approval gives smaller parties even more power to extract concessions, as any prospective government doesn't just need their apathy, it needs their active approval. But remember, even if either bloc convince the smaller parties to back them, there's still not enough votes available for either party to win without the potential kingmakers. 
Late on Sunday, when it became clear that neither the left nor the right had a clear path towards a majority, the party spokeswoman for the Junts stressed that they wouldn't make Sanchez the president for nothing and that their priority would be Catalonia and not the governability of the state. In other words, it's almost guaranteed that the Junts will demand an independence referendum which would be an incredibly hard pill for Sanchez to swallow. And it's worth noting again that without this active support from the Junts, Sanchez can't form a majority. Now, Parliament is set to reconvene after the summer to hold this investiture vote, or more likely votes, in order to try and form a government. And things are so up in the air, we don't even know whether Feijo or Sanchez will get the first attempt at becoming Prime Minister. As leader of the largest party, it would make sense for Feijo to go first, but Sanchez could make the argument to the king that he has the greater parliamentary support. Nevertheless, as I just said, the first investiture vote requires an absolute majority, so both Feijo and Sanchez are very likely to lose it. Success in the second round, though, only requires a simple majority, so abstention by the Junts, as part of a possible deal, would be enough to make someone prime minister. But there's no guarantee this will happen either. That all means, then, that new elections held later this year can't be ruled out. That's because, under the Spanish constitution, once a candidate for prime minister has been put to the Congress of Deputies by the king, a two-month timer starts. And if two months pass, with no candidate able to obtain the confidence of the Congress, the King has to dissolve the Congress and call for new elections. If anything, this means that new elections are probably the most likely outcome here, given the difficulties that Sanchez and Feijo will have negotiating with the smaller parties, let alone the Catalonians. With that in mind, what does all of this mean for Spain and for Europe? Well, the election comes at a pretty inconvenient time, all things considered, for Europe. That's because right now, Spain holds the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union. Now, the presidency of the Council rotates among EU member states every six months, with it being Spain's turn from the 1st of July through to the 31st of December. Now, the presidency has two main tasks planning and chairing meetings with the Council, as well as representing the Council in relations with other EU institutions. In other words, the role of the presidency of the Council is to be a broker, a coordinator. But that won't be easy for Spain when the domestic political situation is sapping away all of the energy and attention. Even ignoring the European implications and focusing on the Spanish political scene, both the socialists and conservatives can and have claimed victory. For Sanchez, though, the gamble does appear to have paid off, for now at least. The fractured left did seem to unite under the Sumar banner, and bouncing the right into an election forced everyone to properly consider what it would mean if the PP truly buddied up with Vox on the national scale. And this spectre of the far right entering national politics for the first time since Franco does seem to have impacted the result, something cited by basically every news outlet under the sun. As such, contrary to expectations, Sanchez's PSOE party averted collapse and actually gained two seats. It's not a disaster for Feijo either. His party is now within striking distance of national government, with he himself on the verge of becoming prime minister, with his party's vote count in parliament surging from 89 to 136. Yet, both Feijo and Sanchez can't claim an unqualified victory. Sanchez might have contained the right, but now he needs the support of a fractured and potentially disruptive coalition in order to govern. While on the other side, Feijo can't rule on the back of Vox's support alone and needs to bring smaller parties into the tent if he's to govern. Ultimately, this election was Feijo's to lose, and with that in mind, he lost it. The only really clear takeaway, though, is how badly Vox did, losing 19 seats. Now, they are still the third largest force in Congress, but only just, with the Sumar platform only two seats behind them. All in all, this might have been Vox's only true shot at national power, a shot they seem to have missed. So that's where things stand right now. Two winners, three losers, 
and maybe more votes yet to come. But as always, things unfold and unfurl in a way you can't expect. So keep paying attention for updates as they develop. In fact, that's probably not a bad idea more generally. Things are always changing and it feels great to stay on top of them as they do. Even within TLDR, I've recently shifted my video editing workflow from Final Cut to Premiere in order to better integrate with the Adobe products our growing team of editors prefer. Now, when I started with YouTube, I just messed around and taught myself Final Cut. But this time round, at the advice of my team, I headed over to Skillshare to take their course on the topic. Unlike when I taught myself the first time round, I was guided through the process quickly and efficiently and barely lost any productivity as I shifted from one tool to the other. It's not just that either. You likely already knew that Skillshare had classes for things like photography, editing, and illustration, but Skillshare also has hundreds of career-focused classes too. Now, we all know at this stage that traditional jobs aren't one size fits all. I mean, I quit my full-time job in marketing so that I could take more control and do YouTube full-time. Now, that's not necessarily the path that you want to take too, but the courses on Skillshare can help you design a career that fits you. That's courses on everything from how to start a business, growing in e-commerce, how to maximize your workflow, or the course I'm taking right now on how to build a business that lasts. And if that sounds interesting, you should use our link in the description, which gives you access to all of that for free. That's right, the first thousand people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So check it out and thanks for supporting the channel.